This is Sky News. In just a moment, the press preview. A first look at what's on the front pages as they come in. First, though, our top stories this evening. Business leaders have criticised tough new immigration measures unveiled by the Home Secretary Theresa May at the Conservative Party conference. Two men have been arrested over the murder of PC Dave Phillips, who was knocked down and killed with a stolen car on Merseyside. The pair in custody are aged 18 and 30. And the world is once again on the brink of recession, according to the latest assessment by the International Monetary Fund, which has cut its global growth forecast for this year. Well, hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the documentary maker and journalist Jenny Kleeman and The Sun's managing editor, Stig Abel. Good to see both of you. Hello, hello. to you. Uh, front pages then, first of all, starting with the Metro. It leads with Theresa May's speech to the Conservative conference in which she announced reforms to make it harder for migrants and asylum seekers to stay in Britain. The Eye also featuring the Home Secretary on its front page, saying critics described her speech as cynical and irresponsible. The Express says Boris Johnson has also called for tougher immigration controls, urging the Prime Minister to get the right deal on the UK's membership of the EU. The Guardian claims the speeches by potential future leaders, Theresa May and Boris Johnson, have put David Cameron under pressure. Meanwhile, The Telegraph reports senior Conservatives have been warned by Downing Street to put aside their leadership ambitions and stick to agreed government positions on the European Union. The Times reveals that hundreds of thousands of failed asylum seekers are set to be deported from Europe within weeks under secret plans being discussed by EU Home Office ministers. The Financial Times reports that technology companies will be forced to overhaul their transatlantic operations after an EU ruling scrapped a deal which allowed them to send personal information to the United States. The Daily Mirror reveals a senior Tory has suggested that up to 50% of NHS beds could be axed. And the Star reports on former England footballer Paul Gascoigne, who's been charged over allegedly harassing an ex-girlfriend. So let's get the view then of Stig and Jenny. Uh, migration everywhere in various forms, starting with the eye and Theresa May and a storm of controversy. Yes, uh, she knew she was going to be whipping up a storm of controversy with her speech today and I think that's perhaps uh, why she made it so controversial. She wanted to be on the front pages. It is a time when all the potential uh, leadership contenders are, are putting their stake in the grass of where they stand. Um, she said a lot of things in her speech today about uh, immigration that um, I completely disagree with. And I, I think also um, have distorted the picture. The fact is the government is not going to meet their net migration target to get the number of, of net migrants to this country less than 100,000. Yeah. But asylum seekers make up a very, very small proportion of the numbers in net migration. It's less than 10%. And the number of uh, asylum applications has been going down. The number of uh, asylum applicants that win on appeal has been going down. And yet she chose to focus on them in her speech. It was a kind of dog, dog whistle speech, I think, that's going to play very well to the right wing of the Tory party. Well, this is what the Daily Mail says, isn't it? Migrants, the woman with the guts to tell the truth. But Theresa May faces a backlash. Exactly. It's not the it, truth. <laughs> but is it the silent majority of people in the UK who well, think that, like she does? That's the audience that she's appealing to. What was interesting, actually, the Tory party, she made this speech, which was, was deliberately strident on, on the issue of immigration. And uh, as Jenny said, the problem for Theresa May is that a lot of the figures that her own department pushes out demonstrates mm. the point that she's making is not true. So uh, she talks about the cost of, uh, of, of, of immigration, people pushing out uh, jobs, and actually uh, people, British people from jobs. And actually, her own department points to statistics which says the exact opposite position. So there is a question mark over the, the factual accuracy of some of the stuff she's saying. But the point of what she was saying for her was this headline in the Daily mm. Mail. She's aiming not just at the audience in the building to try and cement her position as a Tory leader, just at the same time as Boris is doing it, George Osborne mm. did it yesterday. She's appealing to the broader swathe of people in Britain, people who flirted with UKIP at the last election, people for whom immigration isn't a matter of statistics and getting to the bottom of actually what the numbers of migrants mean. It's an emotional, visceral reaction to what they consider to be their country. And right or wrong, and often it's wrong, and often, like any visceral reaction, it's based on prejudices and preconceived ideas rather than facts. It is no the less important in people's minds for that, and that's what she's aimed at. What's striking to me is that she's done it, and virtually no one in the party that I've spoken to, I've spoken to people who've been in the conference, 
seems to have really supported her. Mm -hmm. Like she made this speech at a very right-wing event and we've not exactly been bowled over by people well, saying, oh, thank God Theresa May said it. Yeah, but Boris Johnson's joined in, hasn't he? Get tough on the EU, well, says no, he, Boris. No, he didn't. And, and didn't. Boris Johnson's speech was... And Boris Johnson is probably the only politician in Britain whose speeches you'd actually listen to for pleasure mm. because he can write and he can make jokes. And actually, the course of his speech was a relatively centrist, socially conservative... Uh, social conscience yeah. conservatism that's really the opposite of what May was doing. He did throw a deliberate curveball on the EU because he's saying to Cameron get a good deal get a good deal yeah. a deal which which restricts freedom of, of movement which That's, is which takes us to the yes. Guardian can I just continue this narrative which the papers are sort of picking up on that the pressure from Johnson and May the Guardian says will mean he might have to revisit that thing which is the freedom of movement which is you know the protected area, if you like, and he's going to meet Angela Merkel on Friday. We yes. have to raise that once again. So I'm just the, 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 the narrative from this is how the papers are reacting. The to reason what, what why said we have today. the issue with the, the net migration figures is because of, of, of migration from within the EU. So if if the Tories are going to be serious about getting those figures down, this is definitely what is going to be negotiated. But um, you know, you could say that Boris Johnson's speech positioned him. To the left, I mean, he he, he took a, a sort of swipe at the tax credits, yeah. the proposal for tax credits, whilst May was positioning herself to the right of the Tory party. But I think, given what the opposition is like, the Tories don't need to be right wing because the the Labour Party is so left wing at the moment that it's not like they need to position themselves as being, oh, you know, we are a, a credible alternative on, on the other side. They could be quite centrist and, and win voters who are who think that the Labour yeah. Party is too left. Yeah, but they UKIP don't... still won millions of votes in the well, general election. Very much so. Let's remember more, that. More importantly, Bo Boris Johnson and, and Theresa May can do is because they recognise that the Labour Party is a spent force as an opposition, or they, mm. whether that's right or not, that's what they think. All the Tory strategists will think. Labour have just gone into the weeds, They're, they've gone crazy, they're not going to bother us. Therefore, they can be quite strong on their own views on Europe because they know that Cameron is the one who's going to have to carry the can for this. If they're aiming at 2020, we know Cameron's stepping down, they can ramp up the pressure on Europe because they know what voters want to hear is that freedom of movement should be restricted or large swathes of voters. They also know that's almost certainly going to be impossible to renegotiate because it's a fundamental part of the EU. So they can say, Johnson can say, yeah, you, we really need this to be a sovereign decision taken by mm. our own parliament, knowing that Cameron almost certainly can't deliver that. Yeah, and just briefly onto the Times, um, w which is almost saying that the EU is taking matters into its own hands by uh, threatening to deport hundreds of thousands of uh, economic migrants. So does, does Cameron not need to negotiate so hard if the EU itself is trying to strengthen its own it's borders? Like it actually this. refers to as failed <coughs> asylum seekers. Well, the position on failed asylum seekers, as I understand, it, if you are a failed asylum seeker, mm. you have to leave the country. If you fail to leave the country, you have to be deported. So I don't think they're doing anything more than the law would anyway. ordinarily require them to do. But, but now they're threatening, the paper says, or Brussels will threaten to withdraw aid, trade deals and visa arrangements if countries such as Niger and Eritrea refuse to take back their economic migrants. So the pressure may be on other countries. Yes, but countries like Niger and Eritrea are, are not functioning countries in the way that, that we would consider particularly. You know, that's why we've been granting so many Eritreans asylum. The idea that this is going to make a, a big difference in them accepting people back I think uh, you know it remains to be seen. So how much in the last couple of days have we seen the uh, the beauty contest of pe as people have been describing uh, it for the person who will replace David Cameron? I think it's astonishing I mean George Osborne has had a very good few months Theresa May actually has had a very bad year 18 months about 18 months ago she was standing up to the police she was looking extremely strong as someone who's been given the poison chalice of, of the home office and effectively not let it uh, poison her and that was you know she was the first person originally to recognize the Tories as the nasty party so she was seen as a very strong candidate and George Osborne was seen as this slightly flabby pasty faced man who was going to struggle to convince us that the economy is getting better mm. he has now upped his game at the same time as Theresa May has dropped hers Boris, I think, has come out of a period of the last three or four months of inertia with a speech today that made a lot of people in the Tory party think this could be a figure for the future. But the subject of this story is like, hold your horses, let's focus on, on well, policy and, and let's not have a contest we, right now. We are going to have another four years of this at <laughs> least. Yeah. And, and everyone, you know, I'm almost sick of it already. I don't know, was it a good idea for David Cameron to, to say that he wasn't going to stick around um, at the end of, of the next parliament? Because this is always going to follow him around. And this, you know, if it's like this now, what's it going to be like next year and, and the year after? I think, you know, you have to give Theresa May credit in that you know, she has held on to her job for a very long time, which is unusual for a Home Secretary. Mm. They normally 
don't last very long. Um, I think, and then there's a, I think that it's very tough being a, being a woman and the only female candidate, the only, you know, feasible, conceivable female candidate. And uh, I think there's a, the picture that's apart on the front of, 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 apart from Nicky Morgan, but you know what I mean. The picture on the front of the Times is, is particularly cruel, I think. So there's, uh, yeah, it's just there's the contrast with the, with the Telegraph and there's the... There's the Times. There's I, the Times I, I one. I don't know why they picked this, uh, this picture. I think it's quite cruel. I think, you know, you have to admire her guts even though I do not admire her, her policies or her stand on immigration any one bit. Um, but, you know, this is just... I'm already sick of this uh, leadership contest and I've got another four years of it, so uh, goodness knows what it's going to be a very like. strong. She's a very strong figure. It was just interesting that two years ago there was the beginnings of a sort of a narrative that she was overpoweringly putting herself in a position. And over the last 18 months, it's not quite worked for her in the way that it did a couple of years ago. But Boris has ebbed in out. The real opposition is going to be, is there going to be a coronation of George Osborne? If the economy remains to a certain extent rugged and he's able to continue the process of, of economic growth, he's going to put himself, I think, in a relatively unassailable position in a couple of years' time because he'll have been able to say, you, I've done the job now, I've done the job I was asked to do, give me one, one stage further. So, so what happens then if Zach Goldsmith becomes mayor, then we will have Old Etonian followed by Old Etonian as London mayor and as, as uh, leader of the Conservative Party. It would be very depressing. It will be. And it's the problem that Cameron has. It's why the Ashcroft book was, uh, was uh, so damaging. If you believe it to be damaging, it's because that's exactly the narrative. Posh people who are out of touch. It's interesting about Boris Johnson. He wears his privilege very lightly. Mm. He is posh. He's as posh as Cameron. He's as posh as Osborne. across the board like him. But people like him because he kind, of, he kind of mocks himself slightly for it. And he doesn't make you feel like he's in his position yeah. because of his privilege. It makes you, you kind of think he's there because he's entertaining and he's clever. Mm. And they are two things that kind of transcend those. And he's one in London, which is theoretically at least a Labour heartland, isn't yeah. it, really? And Zach um, Goldsmith has a slight chance to, to do that. Although apparently if you heard the speeches today, it was Zach followed by Boris. And the difference in ability to be orator was absolutely extraordinary. Mm. Uh, while we're on the Times, very interesting story here. Children will work until they hit 100. Oh. Oh, this is an incredible story. Lots and lots of detail in this. Anyway, uh, a continue. futurologist has been talking to head teachers and he said some remarkable things. Mm. Kids in school today, uh, they're going to live till they're 120 uh, or, or even older. They're going to be working till they're 100 and that schools need to teach them better skills like how to relax, how to boost I their memories. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and the idea is that you might be taking... There's an amazing detail here about multiple jobs that the children of the yeah. future will take as adults. They might be driving, driving an Uber cab during the day, renting out their home uh, to Airbnb at the same time, doing deliveries for Amazon. Mm. I think it's a quite dystopian vision of the future. Do you? Well, yeah, I don't want to be doing is. four jobs all working well, the, for tech the worst companies. Part in terms of, you know, the workplace is they say as robots take over traditional tasks, yeah. research suggesting the number of jobs in the British economy would shrink by between 30 and 80 yeah. percent. And so, and so what, basically head teachers need to train pupils to, to, to be, be unemployed. Well, to be multitasking <laughs> to be multi throughout their life. The point yeah. about relaxing, I think, is I, I, we bang on about this. I certainly bang on about this all the time. Mm. But we are living in a massive world of technological change yes. that is going yeah. to have catastrophic potentially yeah. effects on people's mental and physical health, particularly mental health. Kids growing up in a world of social media, mm. all of us in a world where you're never free from electronic Absolutely. connection at any time. And I think that's yeah. a point that comes out of this. That, and it is dystopian. I think you look at the future, a world where everyone lives to a massively long age, where they're compelled to work for a ridiculous amount of time in a world where you can never flee your work. That's the other point that's being made here. If you're you know, working for Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, doing this, that and the other, you're never not working. Mm. And that's never really been a part of, of human development, where you've been able to work and get away from it. That's yeah. actually, that boundary is, is, is crumbling, and I think that is a bit worrying. Yeah, and the fundamental message from this, this man, the chief executive of Fast Future, this futurologist, basically that lessons are completely outdated, and we've got to start again, really, to uh, prepare our kids for the future. people have been saying that for years, <laughs> uh, Lots more still to come, including dispiriting, new, or dispiriting news, rather, for mums to be... <laughs> Hello there, welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview. With me this evening, The Sun's managing editor, Stig Abel, and the journalist and documentary filmmaker, Jenny Kleeman. Welcome back to both of you. Uh, Putin raises the serious stakes with a threat to NATO jets. What exactly is this story about, then? Um, it's to do with uh, jamming equipment that uh, Russia is sending to Syria, uh, which is basically... Uh, could interfere with NATO jets, is escalating. Basically, Syria is becoming the new kind of Cold War battleground. Mm. Um, Putin 
effectively wants to save Assad, prop Assad up, because the targets that Russia is hitting mm. are not IS targets, they are um, insurgency targets. Yeah. Um, Russia wants to maintain a presence in, in the Middle East, uh, influence in the Middle East, and the way that they will do that is by propping up Assad and, uh, and making sure And they're that saying that these, this, this jamming equipment could effectively create a no-fly zone over yes. the parts that Assad controls, and yes. that's why it's important. But this is just one of many stories today uh, about, about uh, Russia in, in Syria. Mm -hmm. Turkey complained that Russian jets have been flying uh, in Turkish airspace. This is potentially very problematic for NATO because Turkey would be within their rights to shoot those jets down. What would happen if that happened? Uh, you know, would we have you know, another escalation in this strange Cold War that we're now having with Putin. Uh, and if Syria didn't have enough to worry about, the fact that they are now, it, the Syrian country is now a pawn in this particular conflict is, is even more tragic. And we've got a political and moral problem here in that we've all said how much we despise Assad for being a chemical butcher. Mm. And yet the prevailing, or some I would argue, the prevailing wisdom is that Assad is not a clear and present threat mm. to the UK or Europe in the way that ISIS is. And at that point, you have to make a strategic decision where you say, mm. we will deal with the clear and present danger which is ISIS at the cost of tackling someone for moral reasons mm. which is a sad and if that decision needs to be made there's a certain degree of uh, authority that someone in Britain or Europe or NATO is going to have to take the, on them. Yeah, but make the only that problem with doing that is, is effectively you turned a blind eye to what President Putin is doing, but some of the people he's targeting are supposedly well, funded indeed. and trained by the CIA. And the problem of appeasing Putin it exists in Ukraine, it exists in, in, in Syria. But there's a question of what is your biggest problem? And if your biggest problem is Putin, then you're going to have to take steps to check him, not let him fly into Turkish air, airspace, stop him doing what he's doing, which is setting mm. the political weather in terms of dealing with Syria. But if you feel that your biggest problem is ISIS, you might have to bear with Putin uh, to enable you to just deal with the problem that you feel you must face yeah. the first. Hello there. In just a moment, the press preview as we take a look at the morning newspapers. First, there are top stories tonight. Business leaders have criticised tough new immigration measures unveiled by the Home Secretary, Theresa May, at the Conservative Party conference. Two men have been arrested over the murder of PC Dave Phillips, who was knocked down and killed with a stolen car on Merseyside. The pair in custody are aged 18 and 30. And the world is once again on the brink of recession, according to the latest assessment by the International Monetary Fund, which has cut its global growth forecast for this year. Hello there, you're watching Sky News and the press preview. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the newspaper headlines with the documentary maker and journalist Jenny Kleeman and The Sun's managing editor, Stig Abel. Very good evening. Hello to you both. Front pages then, first of all, starting with the Metro. It leads with Theresa May's speech to the Conservative Conference in which she announced reforms to make it harder for migrants and asylum seekers to stay in Britain. The Eye also features the Home Secretary on its front page, saying critics branded her speech cynical and irresponsible. The Independent calls the speech an extraordinary attack on immigrants and goes on to list some of the benefits that immigration has brought to the UK. The Daily Mail takes a different view, calling Theresa May the woman with the guts to tell the truth on migration. The Express says Boris Johnson has also called for tougher immigration controls, urging the Prime Minister to get the right deal on the UK's membership of the EU. The Guardian claims the speeches by potential future leaders, Theresa May and Boris Johnson, have put added pressure on David Cameron. Meanwhile, The Telegraph reports senior Conservatives have been warned by Downing Street to put aside their leadership ambitions and stick to agreed government positions on the European Union. The Times reveals that hundreds of thousands of failed asylum seekers are set to be deported from Europe within weeks under secret plans being discussed by EU Home Office ministers. The Financial Times reports that technology companies will be forced to overhaul their transatlantic operations after an EU ruling scrapped a deal which allowed them to send personal information to the United States. The Lady Mirror reveals a senior Tory has suggested that up to 50% of NHS beds could be axed. The Sun, meanwhile, leads with a trial involving a six-year-old boy who died after a doctor allegedly mistook him for another child who had a do-not-resuscitate order. And the Star reports on former England footballer Paul Gascoigne, who's been charged over allegedly harassing an ex-girlfriend. 
So let's talk more then with Stig and with Jenny. Um, migration, Theresa May, it's, uh, it's all over the papers, isn't it? It is all over the papers. Um, and I think that's what she wanted uh, when she made a, a speech like she did today. She wanted to make an impact. Uh, the Daily Mail are, are saying she's the woman with the guts to tell the truth. The Independent have a slightly different take. Um, the fact is we don't hear good news stories about migrants um, because they don't sell papers so much. You tend to hear stories about, uh, you know, migrants on benefits living in uh, luxury houses in Kensington. The independents have some interesting statistics here about uh, immigrants starting nearly half a million businesses, employing lots of people, about how dependent the NHS is on uh, migrants. Also, this is just the tip of the iceberg. S entire industries are dependent on migrants in this country, uh, regardless of what impression Theresa May would have wanted to give today. Like, for example, the care industry, care homes. If, if migrants were all sent back or couldn't come in this country, I don't know how care homes would function. Um, so, Theresa May's speech, obviously, the government have a problem. They made this promise to keep net migration to the tens of thousands, which they will not be able to keep. This is not because of asylum seekers. This is largely because of migration from within the EU to the UK. Uh, but Theresa May focused heavily on asylum seekers that make up a tiny proportion, less than 10% of those net migration figures. She, she announced some things that I think are quite staggering today, including a proposal to send asylum seekers back to their home countries uh, as soon as the threat to their lives was no longer there, as soon as the crisis or the war was over, for example. Think about that. Think about living in a state of perpetual insecurity. If you've been thrown out of your homeland because of war, you're granted asylum, uh, you're granted asylum status here, but you know that you could just be sent back anyway, so don't bother starting a business here. Don't bother setting down roots or anything like that because you're going to be sent back anyway. This is not a way for people to live. This was dog whistle po politics from Theresa May, who is setting out her stall as the right-wing candidate or, for the next, Labour, the next Conservative leadership. Or, as the Daily Mail says, basically speaking for the, for the silent majority who've had enough of it. Well, I'm not sure it's entirely the silent majority. Yes. But, but, uh, uh, <laughs> if you take a look at the UKIP votes, so I suppose she, not. But, but she's yeah. basically... I mean, this is the, the front page that she wanted to, to see when she, she wrote it. And the difficulty that, uh, that, that there is in this argument, which is why she's done what she's done, is that people are concerned, I think, at a very broad level, indiscriminate immigration and while the independents are absolutely right when you can set down the benefits of immigration to this country ultimately even Theresa May in her own speech concedes it's probably a wash in terms of its economic impact actually her own figures would rather suggest it's more positive for the economy rather than negative mm. the problem is we have no controls and that's the argument that Boris advanced in a speech that was broadly uh, moderate isn't necessarily uh, that immigration is bad, which is what Theresa May was doing, which was this emotive, visceral thing, which is popular because people feel, whether correctly or wrongly, that their country is changing in front of them. And that's not a question of necessarily facts and figures. It's not even a question of what personally has happened to them. It's a sense of what they mm. feel is happening in their towns or their village or their cities. And in some parts of the country, there has been a failure of integration. There are parts of, the, of, of cities in the north where you have completely yeah. distinct communities who are not sharing common values or common languages. And that that visceral emotional side is what Theresa May is appealing to here. The broader point, though, that everyone would probably agree on, whether you're moderate or whether you're right-wing or whether you're left-wing, is that the inability of Britain to make the decision about what type of immigration mm. they're happy with is at the heart of that. And that's a European problem rather than a British problem. As we know, with the referendum coming up, yes. as we know, yes. I mean, her, her point that social cohesion is impossible uh, with mass immigration just isn't true because I, I feel that mass immigration isn't the reason why we have social cohesion problems in this country. We have social cohesion problems because of things like faith schools. We have social cohesion problems because of uh, a failure to build housing and people being ghettoised in certain areas. These are political problems that can have political solutions. Saying that it's just because lots of people are coming here, I think it is, is oversimplistic and also denies the reality of the fact that people are just going to come here. They are going to come here. We speak English. Our economy is doing well. This is the flip side of it. They haven't come up with a way of preventing people from coming here. So I think it's unrealistic to just simply simply blame these numbers without having a, a solution to stop these numbers but, if, but, if, if that's the problem. But the bottom line is there is no solution, which is what the point Boris has made in his, his statement. Mm -hmm. Both May and Boris have this ability now because Cameron has said he's here for five years. The EU referendum is on his watch. It's on his head. He's going to have to be the person mm -hmm. who either leads a successful renegotiation 
or uh, campaigns to get out of Europe. Yeah. It's a problem for him. They can manoeuvre themselves around and actually what they're saying is freedom of movement in Europe is something yeah. that should be taken from the European settlement. Yeah, I mean, this is the double page spread in the mail. We were on the double page spread in the sun. The fact that there's so much coverage shows that this is really a crux issue for many people in the UK, don't well, you that, think? Yeah, it, and for Europe as a whole. Immigrate, and, for, and for Cameron as he goes it, to Europe it to is try a significant to, issue to make headway. For, for a lot of people, but I think the solution is much thornier. It's a much more difficult political issue than simply, oh, let's just blame the migrants. We have to look at the reality, which is people are going to try and come here while we're a prosperous country. While we're in the EU as we are, uh, people from within the EU are going to come here. That's what the, large, the largest proportion of those net migration figures is. And I think it's unrealistic to just, you know, we need political solutions to the fact that people feel that there isn't cohesion. And, in this and that's country. one of the criticisms that she oversimplified the migration argument, not least from business. Business hits back at May over migrants at top of the uh, Financial it, Times there. A, Institute of Directors which really are, strong were scathing, weren't they? Well, yes. And they're not, in a, they're not a wishy washy left wing organisation, and so they accuse her of putting party political politics ahead of the country and one of the interesting things about Theresa May's, May's speech is that although the male has gone with her and talked about it as a, a sort of moment where she's speaking the truth to those who are afraid of it otherwise actually there's not been a great uh, groundswell of support for it from people you'd expect them to be mm. so historically right-wing organizations mm. haven't come out you haven't heard many Tories and come out of the conference David hall saying, Cameron was was feeling was quite uneasy to back up what she was saying about it, you know, social cohesion is impossible with levels, levels of money. It's very strong words. And he was not, he was, you know, loath on the radio this morning, loath to back her up, um, you know, confidently. She does seem to be out on a limb on her own, but it is going to go down very well with a lot of people, and, and particularly people within the Tory party. And The, the Guardian um, saying basically the pressure coming from Boris Johnson and Theresa May may mean he has to go back to the drawing board in Europe to start to talk but, about free border controls once again, which he doesn't want to do, and which the Eastern European leaders could not agree to. Oh, no, and it's just not... I mean, it's almost... If you have a, a European settlement with border controls, you might as well not bother having a European settlement. It is intrinsic to the notion mm. of the EU is that there is going to be freedom of movement. And if you were from uh, the, the, the former Soviet bloc, you're terrified of notions of borders closing. So yeah. you will never feel comfortable in an organisation that prevents free movement. And the argument will have to be if Cameron, he won't be able to get movement restricted. Therefore, he's got to work out what he can get, or he's going to have to say ideologically he believes we should be outside the European Union. And he's going to have to make that decision at some point. There's a, the story is going to push this back to 2017. There's a French and a German election between now and 2017. They might well change their governments to people who become more anti-EU than they currently are. That might make his job easier. Mm. The best thing he might do, if he's willing to put up with the brickbats for another two years is to just push this back a little bit. Let Europe go through a couple of political cycles and see if other people can solve the problem for him. Yeah, uh, the Daily Telegraph is, is basically saying get back in your box. The beauty contest has to stop, doesn't it? Halt your leadership bids, stick to the lines on Europe. One, of course, was Boris Johnson. We saw him inside the, uh, the Daily Mail there. How did he do today? Is he, is he back there? Because George Osborne, everyone says, is out out front at the moment. Uh, he's always a crowd pleaser, Boris Johnson, not just with uh, with dedicated Tories, but with the, the public at large, uh, you know, he may be a posh old Etonian, but he is someone that, that people feel that they can relate to across the spectrum. And, uh, and yes, obviously, Quinton Letts, uh, even though he calls him the albino warthog, seems to think that he did very well today. I think it's going to be interesting. The Tory leadership contest is going to be very interesting. I wish it hadn't started four years <laughs> in advance of it, though. He was great, though, and, and I think the one thing you would say that we have a, a paucity of uh, people skillful at political rhetoric in this country. No one uh, issues speeches that you'd ever really pay to listen to or even voluntarily listen to. Boris Johnson knows how to deliver a joke. He knows how to be self-deprecating. Mm -hmm. There were two or three moments in his speech that actually were funny, whatever your political allegiance. You can't really say that about Osborne. You certainly can't say that about mm -hmm. Theresa May. It's almost an automaton in terms of how she mm -hmm. conducts herself politically. Yeah. So he brings a bit of light relief. The question for everyone is, can he be more serious than that? And that's what he'll be positioning. But he's positioning himself in the centre mm -hmm. and he's let Theresa May go off to the right. And maybe he's going to try and stake that ground out of a sort of moderate mm -hmm. Tory. He's very, he's very keen to push this idea that tax credits are unfair on the mm -hmm. poor. He uses the phrase poor, which Tories never well, do. Well, certainly Ian Duncan Smith was, was rolled out today, wasn't he, to defend the government on tax credits again. Oh, gosh, yes. um, but he's also added, and I'll, this is an argument we've heard before, only have kids if you can afford them. Is that is that really sort of conservative, I wouldn't yes. say policy, this is, but this is it is, ideology? This is something that plays very well 
again, with the public, uh, with people who feel that they have made decisions in their life to limit the size of their families and they think of feckless benefits scroungers having loads of kids just so that the public purse can pay for them. I think this is unrealistic. I don't think people have kids necessarily planning that the state is going to support them. I, don't, I think people have kids because they're not planning. Um, and I think that, w the, that children are going to suffer if tax credit payments are limited to the first two children. And also, what does this mean? Does this mean that if people get pregnant with their third child that they should have a termination? What, what, you know, what are we meant to do with this? It's not, it's not China, is it? No, no well, exactly. I think the, but, but I think, that was yesterday's but, story. But <laughs> I, think, I think the problem is, though, that people, some people do have children expect, uh, any numbers of children expect the state to pick up the tab. And also, most people sitting, watching tonight will say, whenever they've decided to have kids, they've tried to work out how to live within their means. We've got two kids, can we afford to have a third child? Is a perfectly legitimate, reasonable conversation for mm. sensible people of to course. have. The notion that you can have kids <clears throat> and other people will pay for that, yes, I think, yeah. is On unreasonable. On the flip side, there aren't people sitting at home saying, uh, oh, I'd like some benefits, I'm going to have another child, or let's have another child because the state will pay for it. It doesn't work out that way. You, you have people, kids because you're not planning. And, there are some people. And why should, why should kids suffer because yeah. your parents are irresponsible? Well, lots more still to come, uh, including could children live as long as 100? They would be expensive then, they wouldn't are. it? And also, does a short fuse mean a short life? Not for those children, but anyway, back in a moment. <laughs> Hello there, welcome back to the Press Preview, taking a look through the newspapers. I'm joined tonight by The Sun's managing editor, Stig Abel, and the documentary maker and journalist, Jenny Kleeman. Extraordinary story in The Times. Children will work until they hit 100, and it's time for a major rethink. This is according to uh, a futurologist. A futurologist which is That's a, gone a bit wrong, hasn't it? Yeah. I'll just reset that one. There we go. Great uh, job. There we are. <laughs> Hopefully in this new world there won't be the job of futurology. No, 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 it'll all be robots. Anyway, it'll, tell us It'll more. all be now. It's an interesting story that effectively <laughs> he's spoken at a conference for head teachers to say that the world is changing so fast you have to change how you teach children because the mm. jobs that you think children will go to and the lives that they will have are not actually likely. It's very likely that kids will live to 100. They'll have up to 40 different jobs. They'll have to multitask. They could have several jobs at the same time. They, and the example they give, which is a very dystopian view, you drive for Uber, you do some deliveries for Amazon, you're renting out closet space, you're renting out your drive, you've got an apartment with Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And that's the world, the world of multitasking, the world where technology has you in such a Cullen-like grip that your whole life is controlled by it. And you're going to live for a very long time, you're going to have to work for a very long time, the job market is going to contract. To me, this is a hugely bleak mm. painting of what life is going to be like you, for our children. Do you think children. zero hours contract is almost a way that we're already starting to go there? You get work where you can. Well, the notion of being in a job for 30 years, which yeah. was the yeah. hallmark of my parents' generation, yeah. has already With gone. That lovely final, you know, final salary of pensions. Salary and pension that and also, also, self employment is becoming more of a norm. I'm self employed. I have always been self employed. Mm. And uh, of course, I'm a trailblazer, and everyone else is following. But this, <laughs> this would suggest that I, I do think in the future more people are going to be living this way, where you're kind of hustling for work, making money as and when you can. There are going to be more people on this planet as we all live longer. It was you know, saying an ch average child, 11 year old child is going to live to 120. Wow. Uh, of course, we're going to need more people looking after us in our old age and maybe that can't just be done by robots. So those jobs are going to be there. But it's a very fascinating look at the future. Mm. Um, one of the things he suggests is that teachers need to be able to, to uh, teach their kids how to relax because that's going to be something that we're not used to in this world where we all have devices on us that we're, we're making money out of. How do you switch off? How do you find mental space for yourself? There may be a backlash. I don't want to be a horrible old Marxist about this, but you know, in any time in history when there is a development of something, there's always a reaction that brings it back down again. And there's an argument that actually the world we're living now is not sustainable. Yeah. Not least we're living too long and we're too connected. Mm. And that's going to have an effect for mental health. When you finish um, work, you don't finish work. Well, you don't finish. Your whole, uh, when you leave school, you don't leave school. Duty. We yeah. are now basically being conducting a giant global uh, experiment mm. to see whether humans will crack up if you keep yeah. them connected for 24 Which hours a day. Which kind of, but not quite, takes us to the middle.